start. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the 15th meeting of this year of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. Remind you to switch off your electronic advices. They can interfere with the sound system. And uh, that uh, we will uh, obviously notice that some committee members may consult tablets during the meeting because this is because we provide meeting papers in digital format for the younger generation. Um, agenda item one is subordinate legislation. First item today is for the committee to consider the following negative instrument. Marketing of Vegetable Plant Material Amendment Scotland Regulations 2014 SSI 2014 stroke 111. Members should note that no motion to annul has been received in relation to this instrument and I refer members to the paper. Is there, are there any questions or comments? Who knows the Latin for uh, a tomato now then? Um, in which case, if there are no further comments, then I ask the committee, are we agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument? There being none, we note that. Thank you. Agenda item two today is, again, subordinate legislation. This agenda is for members to take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary on single-use carrier bags charge, Scotland Regulations 2014. The instrument has been laid under the affirmative procedure, which means that the Parliament must approve uh, this before provisions may come into force. Following this evidence session, the committee will be invited to consider the motion to approve the instrument under agenda item three. And uh, I welcome the Cabinet Secretary, uh, Richard Lockhead, this morning, and uh, Peter Stapleton, Policy Manager for Waste Prevention Scotland uh, in the Scottish Government. Good morning, and I ask the Cabinet Secretary if he wishes to speak to the instrument. Good morning, thank you, Convener, and it's good to see you are wearing the same tie this morning, as indeed are many members of the committee, to celebrate Learning uh, <coughs> Disability Awareness Week and their Enable Scotland ties. So I'm pleased to be here, though, to discuss a, a very important issue for Scotland's environment because I believe the introduction of a charge for single-use carrier bags will be one of Parliament's uh, highest-profile environmental measures since this Parliament was founded. And, of course, it's a measure that will affect everyone in Scotland and show that Parliament is ready and willing to take a lead to tackle Scotland's litter problem in, in particular. Scotland uses around 750 million single-use carrier bags, believe it or not, just from supermarkets alone. Uh, that's more per head than anywhere else on these islands. And indeed, that's the equivalent to 12 bags per person in Scotland for each month of the year. So we want to reduce the number of these bags been giving out to help tackle the, the blight of litter in our streets, in our countryside, and of course in our waterways. They can form a very highly visible and damaging component of litter and have a particular impact also on Scotland's seas. So this measure should therefore be seen as part of our wider work in tackling Scotland's litter problem, particularly this 2014, the year of the Commonwealth Games and Ryder Cup, when we're inviting many people to come and visit our shores, and we want to make sure our, our country is looking beautiful. Single-use bags are also a symbol of the throwaway society. Uh, this policy, of course, is all about attaching a value to something perhaps that many people have not attached a value to in the past because it's free, and it's also about engaging the widest possible uh, number of people in environmental behaviour to encourage everyone who will be affected by this policy to consider their own impact on Scotland's environment and again particularly on Scotland's litter problem. So by placing a value on these items we want to encourage people to reuse their bags and consider switching to alternatives. Beyond this we are of course promoting reuse of other items to help get the most out of our increasingly limited resources and cut carbon emissions at the same time. So these regulations are designed to offer a proportionate response to the issue. We have been careful to ensure that the administration will be as light, light touch as possible, eh, particularly for smaller businesses. It is a requirement to charge, it is not a tax. While the purpose is about influencing behaviours rather than fundraising, we are encouraging retailers to donate the net proceeds to good causes. We have every reason to believe that the majority will do the right thing. 
It is clear that there is support for this measure from many retailers, from their customers, from environmental NGOs, hopefully from Parliament, and of course last year's consultation saw a strong response in favour of the charge and we have had a constructive dialogue with stakeholders during the whole of this process. There is a growing international appetite for action as well. It's not just here in Scotland. Many countries, regions and cities around the world have introduced measures to tackle bag use. Similar changes are working well in, in Wales and Northern Ireland, just looking at these islands, with even the UK government now set to introduce a charge in England. Indeed, it seems likely that action will be required across the whole of the EU in the next few years. So it's clearly time for Scotland to act, and therefore I ask the, the committee to support these regulations. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. And we move to uh, questions from members. Um, Graham Day wishes to ask a question. Uh, uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. C can I just clarify something, Cabinet Secretary? In Section 88 of the Climate Change Scotland Act, there's a reference to the net proceeds from this measure uh, being used for environmental protection improvements or similar. However, in Zero Waste Scotland's issue at the weekend, they talk about to donate the, the net proceeds from the chain, the charge to good causes. It's a phrase you used yourself, and it, they said that, that may include environmental causes. We seem to have moved away from the original idea. Have we done so, and if so, why? <clears throat> Thank you. Well, as I said in my original remarks, this is not a measure simply to raise funds. It's a measure to cut down the use of bags in society. And clearly, the more people, which of course is something already happening, that reuse bags, the less charges there will be and the less funds will be raised over time. So the objective is not to raise the funds per se, it's to reduce the, the use of bags in society to help the, the litter problem. However, we have been in discussion with our retailers in Scotland and we expect environmental causes to benefit from the funds that are raised. So the agreement we have with the retailers is that the funds raised will go towards good causes and that may include environmental causes. Why are we not simply saying environmental causes? Well, clearly, some retailers already charge for bags, and they give that money to good causes. And some of those good causes could be local hospices, or they could be other uh, good causes locally that are not necessarily directly related to the environment. So rather than put down a, a, a firm demand that went to environmental causes that may cut across existing charities that benefit, we are encouraging those retailers that will be introducing a charge to include environmental causes and the beneficiaries of the, the funds raised. Okay. If I may, thank you for that answer. Um, given that this seems to be a good dialogue going on here, can we be assured that the funds raised, accepting that raising funds isn't the, the main uh, purpose of this, will be spent and will be uh, redeployed in Scotland, that they will not go out with the borders of this country? I have every confidence that the funds raised will be spent in Scotland, and, and that's the, the tone of the agreement we have with the retailers. So we have the Scotland's Carrier Bag Commitment, which is the agreement we've signed, or will be signing, uh, should these regulations be passed by this committee in Parliament, uh, that the green light will be given, and then we'll seek the signatures for the commitment. And the commitment itself, of course, lays out various aspects of the agreement involving retailers. So we anticipate the majority, if not all, retailers signing the commitment will certainly be urging that. And within that commitment will be uh, various criteria of how they will report and publish the information in terms of what they're, they're raising and where that money is going towards, etc. Uh, so ultimately, that, mu that information will be put in the public domain and public opinion and Parliament and everyone else with interest will be able to see through transparency uh, where the, the funds raised are going uh, and uh, the experience elsewhere, particularly in Wales, is that you know, this will work out good and the funds raised will go towards good causes. Okay, thank you. Um, Alec uh, Ferguson. <clears throat> um, thank you, Convener and Cabinet Secretary. I hope you'll bear with me. I've got a number of questions about this because I have a number of concerns about it, to be perfectly honest. Um, and I think it all stems from the fact that I think there is a, a public perception that this levy refers specifically to plastic bags. And I would have much less difficulty with it if it did. Um, but it doesn't. It includes paper bags. And I just wonder, my understanding is that evidence from Wales suggests that paper bag usage is now back to almost exactly the same level as it was before the legislation came in. Um, and I wonder if you could just comment on why you chose to include plastic bags, particularly 
um, and this is a particular focus of my concern, particularly in relation to food-to-go outlets, fast food, where there is some evidence to show that actually providing a plastic bag with the various containers and things that come along with a, a carry-out food meal actually enable uh, the litter disposal aspect of it to be rather better managed because you put all your stuff back in the bag and stick that in a bin rather than chuck all the various containers out the car window. So I just wonder if you could go into your thinking behind including pla uh, paper bags in this legislation. Well, clearly, I think there's a number of obje objectives that lie behind this policy, <coughs> particularly learning from the experience of other countries. So the objectives include cutting down the waste in society, tackling behaviour in society in terms of the throwaway society we have at the moment. We can encourage people to think a bit more about their environmental behaviour because we're in the habit, habit, for instance, of accepting single-use bags from the shops when we go there. Thankfully, more and more people now are taking bags that can be reused and bags for life. But still, as the statistics show, there's 750 million single-use carrier bags being uh, given out by our, our, our big supermarket chains. So if we can encourage people to think twice about their environmental behaviour, I think that will be a huge step forward. So yes, it's about cutting down carbon emissions. Yes, it's about cutting down waste. But importantly, it's about influencing behaviour and trying to encourage people to think twice about their environmental behaviour. So plastic bags clearly are a major nuisance in society to a degree in terms of litter. But other bags are as well. So it's the environmental behaviour we're trying to engage with here. And that's all bags, all single-use bags. So uh, near my home, uh, before I travelled to Parliament uh, this week, um, I was out on my bike for a cycle, and of course I'm seeing uh, paper bags littering the side roads in the countryside. I'm cycling by, it's uh, annoying me greatly, and they're from some well-known fast food chains. Uh, and I expect that's a site many people are familiar with from throughout our communities in Scotland. So it's about tackling that culture and that behaviour, and I think if we can at least engage with the greatest number of people in society, which this policy will certainly do, hopefully that will have a positive impact. May I continue to just to explore? But thank you. I, mean, I, I, I appreciate the explanation. I'm also interested that you continue to use the term single-use carrier bags because I understand in, uh, in the official report on 6 January 2009, you agreed um, following figures from RAP, which indicated that approximately 74% of carrier bags were actually reused, that the term single-use carrier bag was actually inappropriate. But given, given the evidence from Wales, which, as I say, I understand shows that paper bag usage is back to pre-legislation levels. Clearly, uh, and what's going to make us different to the Welsh um, if, if this um, educating the public uh, about litter is, is what's going to make us different to the Welsh experience? Well, the Welsh experience has shown a dramatic fall in the number of bags, single-use bags, given out. And therefore, this policy hopefully will have a similar impact in Scotland. And that figure of 750 million uh, that I referred to will be dramatically reduced in the years ahead once the, the, the charge comes into force. Uh, in terms of food, because I think you did mention food in your previous question, and perhaps didn't address that adequately, uh, we decided to include fast food outlets because, again, other countries have done that and we've looked at their experience. And there are some regulations that give exemptions under which circumstances uh, there does not need to be a charge, they're exempt. So, for instance, uncovered hot food can be put in a bag and that bag does not have to be charged for. But if the food you buy from a fast food outlet is covered and then put in a bag, then a sh charge should apply. And of course, all the guidance we'll be issuing uh, over the next few weeks will go out to all the, the outlets and retailers uh, and give guidance uh, on exactly where the exemptions apply and where they don't. So we have looked at the experience of other countries. Uh, and indeed, I think the European Parliament were just looking at their legislation and they threw out an amendment that widened the exemptions to include all fast food outlets. So similarly, Europe is looking at this as well and have decided to include fast food outlets and hot food. So I think we just have to strike a balance. We want to be light touch about this, we want to be sensible and move forward. Uh, there's a lot of education involved in this in terms of, you know, so people are aware when they'll have to pay a charge when they don't. But again, I think the net impact of this policy will be really good for Scotland's environment and really good for Scotland's litter problem. Could I have one final question, Kavina, if I may? Thank you. Um, 
supplementary in which we will, <coughs> case in which case will allow you to do so. This is my intended final question at this point in time. Um, you, you mentioned um, in your original opening statement that you'd had strong constructive dialogue with, with all stakeholders. Um, you will be aware, I suspect, of a company called Smith Anderson in Kirkcaldy, who manufacture paper bags and are major suppliers to both McDonald's and Burger King. Um, they believe that this measure could cost them 40 jobs. Can I just ask what your reaction is to that? Well, clearly we have looked at this in going forward, and some of the companies involved produce a wide range of bags, including single-use bags, so they will have to adapt as this policy comes into force. We have looked at the impact on employment in Scotland. As you know, the assessment we looked at said that estimated employment it will see an increase in the wider economy of 53 jobs versus an estimated reduction of between 18 and 84 jobs in the carrier bag sector. So that's our best estimate looking at this. We have, over uh, recent months, been speaking to the enterprise agencies to ensure they're also speaking to these companies involved to see if any help can be given to them. And we'll make sure that happens going forward as well. Uh, again, it's been very difficult to identify experience in other countries that have put these policies in place of any identifiable job losses. I'm not sitting here saying there's not jobs impacted. I'm just saying it's quite difficult looking at experience in other countries to come up with some exact figures of how they've, their jobs have been affected. So we'll pay close attention to this and we'll work with the companies concerned if there's anything we constructively can do to help them adapt. Well, I, I thank you for your answers. I, I absolutely share a, a de detestation of litter, uh, as, you, as everybody does. Um, I, if I was convinced that the measures in this um, legislation that referred to paper bags would reduce that litter, then I, I would be more in favour it. As it is, I'm afraid I'm going to have to uh, just choose to disagree with you on this occasion, Cabinet Secretary, and I'm likely to oppose this when it comes to a vote. But thank you for answering my questions. Okay. Uh, Jim Hume next. Yeah, yeah. Thanks very much, convener, and good morning, uh, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I just think we should recognise uh, Mike Pringle, the f former MSP, who two sessions ago started a members' bill on this on this very subject. I think that's appropriate at this time. Um, but, uh, you, Cabinet Secretary, you also mentioned uh, about encouraging retailers and believing the majority would uh, actually uh, go ahead and do the, the charging. How do you see reviewing that, keeping a, a, an eye on if you actually are going to make the majority or uh, what sort of instruments will be in place um, to encourage, or perhaps even more than, more than the majority, uh, to take up the, this new regulation? We'll certainly be keeping an eye on this, and Zero Waste Scotland are creating a, a central portal. So one positive dimension of our policy in Scotland compared to perhaps what other countries are doing is we are collating the information we get from the retailers to a central point and Zero Waste Scotland will host the website so the public, environmental organisations, anyone else with interest will be able to go on that and see the information. And that's a very helpful contribution from the retailers and will of course lend a lot of transparency to the process. So that in itself I think will help the monitoring because public opinion and you know uh, wider bodies of interest, specific, specific interest in these issues will no doubt pay close attention to that. If need be, of course, we'll return to the regulations at some future date. Uh, we're taking a light touch approach just now. We have no reason whatsoever to believe this will not work because we've looked at the good experience of other countries. So therefore, we're confident this approach will work. The Climate Change Act, which we're using as the vehicle, as you know, for this legislation, allows us to do certain things but should the need occur in the future to put more regulation in place, we'd have to look at how to bring that forward. <coughs> Morning. Hmm? Much as I hate to disagree with my colleague uh, Alec Ferguson uh, across the, the table here, um, surely if, if, if paper bags were excluded, all that would happen is people would stop using plastic bags and they would all switch to paper bags, which would then mean that we'd have to cut down an awful lot more trees, uh, you know, to supply all the extra paper bags that we would have to use. 
Well, yes, and also it would be difficult to change culture and change behaviour in society if we did not have a much more holistic approach to this. I would, of course, gently point out that I thought that it was UK government policy to introduce a, a similar charge, <laughs> uh, and uh, so there appears to be cross-party support for this across these islands. Uh, however, we'll wait at the detail from the, the Conservative Lib Dem coalition government in London. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> one further point, just going back to uh, the discussion about the good causes. Have you had any discussion with the retailers and so on um, about maybe a proportion of their funds, you know, a certain percentage going to environmental causes? Because if you just leave it at good causes and may go to environmental, they could do 100% for good causes, which would be a good thing in itself. But given that the the littering aspect is quite an important part here. You know, maybe, I don't know, 30%, 40%, 50% maybe should actually go to environmental causes. I just wonder if you've um, had any discussions with them on that. We have discussed with them that we are keen for environmental causes to be supported. But for the reasons I gave earlier, we're not stipulating that this should only go to environmental causes because that would cut across existing relationships between some retailers and some good causes. And I'm sure we are all familiar with that from our own constituencies and therefore would not want to interfere with those relationships. But again, that's why we'll keep a close eye on this. We are confident environmental causes are going to benefit. If it turns out not to be the case, clearly we'll return to this issue and keep up the dialogue with the retailers. But again, just looking at experience elsewhere, there's no reason to think that will not be the case. And the commitment, the, the carrier by commitment that we have stipulates, of course, that money given to good causes that are raised through this charge is additional to existing donations to good causes. So we, we, we're confident it's not going to be displacing donations to good causes at the moment. It will be in addition to. Um, Graham Day wants a supplementary on that point. Are there other people who are on the same point as well, or is that a different one? Because I've got a list of uh, Claudia, Nigel and Cara so far. But Graham, OK, on this? Fine. Uh, uh, thank you. Can I say, just, just to ex explore the, the, the interaction with the, the retailers a little further, from the discussions you've had, are you confident that when the funds are dispersed to... Dispersed to um, uh, environmental causes. They will be going to perhaps some small scale local projects and not simply giving in large sums to single organisations or large sums to single projects. Well, some retailers, of course, and I don't pretend to be an expert in all these relationships retailers have with their local causes, but it's safe to say that from my own experience, many retailers and from our investigations with this issue have local relationships and therefore the local supermarket tends to support local good causes in that locality. And we'd anticipate that being the case with the funds raised in this charge. Thank you. And Alec Ferguson on this, another supplementary in this? Yeah, on, on this subject, I, I, I noticed in some of the written evidence we'd had that uh, in Wales, um, I think one supermarket chain, maybe more, have chosen to um, give the proceeds of the levy to a specific NGO. And I just wondered whether I mean, we, we could be talking about considerable amounts of money being given to um, organisations, which, if it happens, would be fine. Um, but I just wonder when the government is looking at funding an NGO that has received possibly a considerable amount of money through this levy, would it be taking that into account when um, determining how much money to, to distribute to, to these organisations? Well, generally speaking... When the government supports NGO activity, it's for specific projects. So that would all depend upon the nature of the project, to be honest. And uh, clearly, there are examples in the past where we've worked with retailers themselves on specific environmental projects. And we've had joint projects with them. So there's a whole variety of models out there. And so I'm not going to say that, yes, that would definitely be the case. We take that into account because there's just so many different circumstances. I think the key is that we have the opportunity in the short term, the more successful the policy becomes, the less money will be raised, but in the short term we have several million pounds that will potentially be raised for good causes in Scotland that would not otherwise be there. And that's good news for local campaigns and charitable causes in all our communities. Okay. Fine. And we move on to Claudia Beamish. 
Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. I, I see this as a very positive step forward in, in relation to um, our climate change commitments and also um, the, the dreadful case, cases we see of littering um, in rural areas as well as urban. Could I just ask you, um, in that context, about what Scottish Government is doing in relation to public awareness about this whole issue a little bit more, and also just... Uh, <coughs> If, if there are any concerns about the ability of local authorities as the enforcement authority, just if you could clarify a bit more about their responsibilities. Okay, thank you. We do have a communications plan, which of course will be very, very important. And the charge comes into play on the 20th of October. And we have a three-week campaign planned in the run-up to that date and then a two-week campaign thereafter. So over that period of time, we will be working uh, with retailers and with the media to, to raise awareness about this policy. And that will hopefully generate a lot of publicity and get the message across to lots of people. And, and my understanding is, and no doubt members will hopefully share this view, there's a lot of public support for this policy, so people will engage. And, and just in terms of the local authority enforcement, um uh, Apologies, yes. So in terms of local authorities, we also have to work with our local authorities. Again, we're having a very light touch approach to this, but the trading standards officers in local authorities will have the responsibility for any checks and for following up any intelligence led information that they receive. So I, I don't anticipate lots of inspections happening or anything like that. Clearly, if it's intelligence led and people report to their local trading standards office, that the policy has not been adhered to by whoever, then they may have grounds for, for looking at that and giving advice, perhaps, in the first instance. I mean, it's going to be a light-touch approach. Okay. Uh, Nigel Don. Thank you very much, much. Convener, and good, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, I've, I've heard what you said earlier about the explanation, so I'm working within that. Um, I think I, I'm slightly surprised that there doesn't appear to be anything uh, within the regulations that... that separates out biodegradable materials. I think somebody just looking in on this would say, well, if that bag is biodegradable, then surely we would treat it differently. Now, as I say, I heard what you said, litter is litter, and, and it doesn't matter whether it's biodegradable, but of course biodegradable litter does eventually go away, whereas a non-biodegradable plastic plainly doesn't, and that's, I think, is the thing we really are worried about. So could you explain to me, perhaps, what your thinking is on why materials don't matter in this context, if, I, if I'm right in that, which I think is the position, and secondly, whether we might in time want to modify the regulations to, to adapt, uh, as perhaps the marketplace adapts to materials anyway. Well, clearly visible litter does not differentiate between biodegradable and non-biodegradable. Visible litter is visible litter, and it's a, it's a social nuisance, and it the spoils are a lovely environment and countryside in Scotland, as well as our communities. So that's why we took the, the view that we will focus on single-use bags, attach a value to that, again, to return to the theme of trying to influence environmental behaviour in society. Uh, so we have had to consider all these issues, again, just looking at international experience and looking at what we think would be suitable for Scotland, and tackling the litter problem and our throwaway society, we decided just to go for single-use bags, uh, irrespective. I'm not sure if Peter wants to elaborate on any of the, the thoughts in the, uh, at the beginning of the process. I think a couple of things have, have, have already been said. I mean, the point that we had from uh, Doug Thompson about switching, you know, if you, if, you, if you don't make it material neutral, then automatically you create an incentive for retailers to switch from one material to another. Uh, and, you know, the overall aim of the policy is, is, is to reduce the number of bags. I think the other point which hadn't been mentioned is on the carbon impact of bags. Obviously, uh, all bags have a lesser impact. Paper and biodegradable bags actually have a significantly higher carbon impact uh, than, than plastic bags. So that's, again, a reason for us not wanting to do something which sort of creates a switching to those types of materials. And when the Environmental Audit <coughs> Committee uh, looked at the UK government's proposals on this, they were quite critical of that aspect in particular. 
Right, that's, that's, thank, thank you. That, that's a very interesting input, because if biodegradable materials have their own downside, then, then that's a significant part of the argument. But presumably, what we would be looking at in the longer term is that those bags that we do need, because some things will need to be thrown away, should be in biodegradable bags so that we actually finish up with zero non-biodegradable waste. I'm not quite sure what timetable I'm working on, decades probably, but presumably that's where we'd want to finish. I think that, that is a debate for future policy. Uh, and there's obviously much wider debates that are linked to the specific debate over bags. Yeah. There's a much wider debate about resources in society and uh, biodegradable materials that go into landfill, etc. And there's separate regulations that address some of these issues. Um, so. um, Cara Hilton. Um, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I, mean, I welcome the proposals today. Um, Litter is a big problem in my constituency, so I'm hoping it's going to address the eyesores that we all see on the way to work every morning. And my question sort of relates a bit to what Claudia said earlier about public awareness. And I was reading the submission from the Scottish Retail Consortium in particular about the um, possible impact on retail employees. Um, obviously, shop workers at the moment, they're subject to um, a lot of threats and abuse as part of their job. Um, and how will you be working uh, with retailers to ensure that the carrier bag charge um, doesn't just open up another, another avenue for shop workers to be attacked by angry customers? Well, clearly, I'd be very concerned if that was the case, and hopefully we, we can avoid that uh, by ensuring that there's a, the widest possible publicity around Scotland prior to the implementation of the policy on the 20th of October. And as I said before, I think it's safe to say that there's uh, a lot of public support for this. And I think Keep Scotland Beautiful just published their own opinion poll in the last uh, couple of days, showing, again, significant support amongst the public for this policy. So I've got no reason to, to anticipate there'll be any degree of hostility from the public. I'm not saying everyone will support it, but in terms of people going about their daily shopping, uh, hopefully people will get behind this, this policy, uh, especially given there'll be an awareness campaign prior to the actual policy coming into force. I would also just point to the fact that other... Many stores already charge, um, and I'm not aware of any such instances from those stores. I'm not saying, you know, they've not happened because there's just got no evidence, but we have, uh, you know, a whole range of outlets at the moment in Scotland do charge for bags. Uh, so this is not something that's wholly new. Uh, clearly, the policy will make it a, a, a national policy, but already some retailers have gone down this road of their own accord voluntarily. Uh, so... This has been, you know, tried and tested, uh, and uh, it works in many retailers. Well, uh, I just say I accept that, but I just, I mean, uh, yeah, I know you say there's a lot of public awareness, but I, I would say most people aren't aware that these charges are going to come in at this stage. So I welcome the campaign that you're talking about, but also there's a lot of cynicism um, about supermarkets and where they spend the money, and there's probably quite a lot of people will think that this is just another way of boosting supermarkets' profits. So it's just from that point of view that I'm concerned about the impact on shop workers. But I appreciate the points that you've made. Yeah, that's very good. A very good point. And again, that's why the awareness campaign is so important and also why we're putting a lot of effort into transparency over what is raised and where the monies are going to and why Scotland's slightly ahead of the game because we've... We've been down the road of also having a central portal that will be hosted by Zero Waste Scotland so people can go onto the website and see where the money is going uh, on the assumption that retailers sign up to the commitment, which we'll know about in the next few months. Uh, and I remember the Welsh minister saying to me when I was having a chat with him at one point about this, and I don't want to put words into his mouth, but I'm sure I remember him saying this, uh, which was that whilst there was some reluctance from some of the retailers in Wales prior to the introduction of the charge, now they go to great lengths to advertise in-store how much they're raising and where the money's going to in good causes. So consumers and customers are, are able to see that as they go into the local store. So they're making a virtue of the fact now they're, they're raising this money and giving it to charities. Um, there was mention made of the uh, plastic bag uh, levy bill uh, in uh, a previous parliament, which both yourself and myself have been uh, a party to the discussions of us. We were members of that committee, Cabinet Secretary. Can you just um, remind members here what has changed since uh, that was dealt with in those days and where we are now? Yes, I remember that well, <laughs> having been involved in the debate uh, at the time. 
there's a couple of key differences. Firstly, we are introducing a charge as opposed to a tax effectively. And the administration involved in what we're doing is a lot less than what's previously proposed. And I don't think anyone argues with the fact that what was previously proposed was well-intentioned and certainly helped spark the debate in Scotland. And, you know, I, I, I know it was a very good debate we had back in Parliament those years ago. Uh, the other change, of course, is that that was a plastic bag measure and our regulations, as we've just discussed, cover uh, single-use bags irrespective of whether they're plastic or paper. Thank you very much for that. Any further questions at the moment? If not, uh, then we will move on to uh, agenda item three. And the third item today is consideration of the motion S4M 10052, asking for the committee to recommend approval of the affirmative instrument, the single use carrier bag charge Scotland regulations 2014 draft. Uh, the motion will be moved with uh, an opportunity for a formal debate on the SSI, which uh, can procedurally last up to 90 minutes. In practice, most issues will have been covered, I hope, and uh, indeed we can have some more brief remarks than that. But I would invite the Cabinet Secretary to speak and move the motion. Uh, thank Secretary. you very much, Convener. My, my remarks are very, very brief. I think we've covered good grounds in our previous conversation. As I said before, I think this will be a landmark piece of legislation for the Scottish Parliament to adopt, should it be passed, in terms of making a very strong environmental statement that we want to tackle the throwaway society in Scotland and tackle our litter problem as well. The Government has gone to great lengths to ensure we can work in partnership with our retailers and business community in taking this forward, and that's why we have favoured the light-touch approach. So whilst it will be law and we will expect a charge to be introduced for what's previously been free single-use bags in, in, in our country. Uh, the, the approach will be to keep that as light touch as possible. Uh, and of course the benefits will include a cleaner environment, a more beautiful environment in Scotland, uh, and in terms of using our resources more wisely by creating less waste, and at the same time raising potentially millions of pounds for good causes in our local communities, for environmental causes and other causes. So I think this is a big step forward for Scotland's environment, uh, and we have gone to also great lengths to learn from other countries who have made a success of this policy, and I am very, very confident we will make a success of this policy uh, in Scotland also, uh, and that the people of Scotland uh, will get behind this as a way of cleaning up their country. Yes, and you should... And I formally move the motion. Yeah. Okay. Uh, other members wish to speak in the formal debate? Alec Ferguson. Um, thank you very much, convener, um, and thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I, I don't want to rehearse the arguments I, I um, went over with you before. And I, want, I would like to put on record my disappointment that um, the roundtable of retailers that we'd hoped to engage with, I think it was just last week, chose not to come in front of the committee because I think it would have given... Uh, us as committee members, and certainly myself, an opportunity to tease out some of the issues that I was talking about. Um, however, that, that, that was the decision that was taken, and um, we are where we are. I, I think it has slightly um, reduced our ability to really get into some of the details of this in, in the depth that perhaps I would like to have done. And I do find in reading the written evidence that's been submitted to us that there is quite a lot of conflicting um, evidence within it. Um, I, I remain unconvinced that this legislation is going to achieve the aim. I hope I'm wrong, and I mean that quite sincerely. But I, I, am, I, mean, I couldn't help but notice that in the Republic of Ireland, which achieved a supposed 90% reduction in plastic carrier bag usage, the total use of plastic film actually increased by 33%. Um, because people found other ways of using different forms of, of plastic to, to reuse, if you like. And, and um, as I say, I hope I'm wrong, but I, I think there is evidence to suggest that we haven't really thought this through in quite the way that I think we should have done, especially, as I mentioned in my questioning, in regard to the, the food-to-go sector use of paper bags. I think we really have a problem with that. Um, and I hope Dave Thompson would recognise that I was focusing really not on just on a complete use of paper bags instead of plastic. I was trying to focus on particularly that one sector. Um, so, uh, as I say, I don't want to go over the whole thing again, but I, I am unconvinced that this legislation is as rigorous as it needs to be, and for that reason I will be opposing this in a vote. Uh, I repeat, I hope I'm wrong. Other members wish to take part? 
Graham Day. Uh, just briefly, convener, I, I think this is about helping bring about attitudinal and behavioural change in relation to the environment. And it's something that this committee has explored in detail and been very supportive of. Um, in terms of the food to go sector, if it involved charging for the wee bag into which your pie or pastry is put, um, but when you purchase it from the baker, I, I perhaps have some sympathy with Alec Ferguson's point, but it's about the carrier into which these are then put, and carriers are ca carriers in this uh, situation. I, I also very much recognise the Cabinet Secretary's description of what he's encountered in his own constituency and the verges uh, of, of the rural roads. Um, we, we seem to have people now who consider it we bag the receptacles for drink and burgers and then toss them out the window and litter our countryside. So I absolutely support the measures that are before us. Thank you. Anyone else who wishes to speak? As Nigel Don. Yeah. Thank you, Vina. Can I, can I just, just add to that? First of all, can I endorse everything that Graham's just said about the, the verges as we leave our communities? I mean, it really is quite appalling, uh, and, and anything that can improve that has got to be a good idea. Uh, can I also just, just comment on, on the fact that the Cabinet Secretary has made a lot of reference to experience from elsewhere, and of course he should, and that's absolutely right. I can't just help but feel that once we've introduced this, as I'm sure we will, there will then be a few years of our own experience. And, and I think I would suggest at this stage is we need to be prepared to come back to this at some point and just look at how it's worked, recognise what the objective really is, which I think we all endorse, and then say, do we need to, to tweak it? I don't think there's anything wrong with it at this stage. I think we, we just have to go with what we've got in front of us. Uh, but just be alert to the fact that in time we may feel it just needs to be modified a bit, and that shouldn't worry us. That's what parliaments do. If that's uh, all, I'd just like to say one or two words. Um, I welcome this discussion today because it throws up uh, all sorts of potential um, means for us to try and improve people's behaviour. Uh, we aren't perfect the way we do that, but uh, we make steps forward because it respects local decisions made by supermarkets as to how they uh, think that... Uh, and indeed local shops about how they will support local good causes and that the evidence from Wales is of environmental nature of many of these which I would encourage. And it also puts a value on bags which has not been there before. In a throwaway society you have a situation where people just take them and throw them away and we have to go away, move away from a, a, a throwaway society to one which puts value on each of the items we're talking about. Um, the national standards uh, which have been set, I welcome, uh, but their local de delivery is one of the major messages that I would hope would come out from this discussion just now, because we're often said about uh, governments being interfering, but I think this is a good example where the national standards can be applied and delivered locally with local responsibility taken. And uh, with regard to the remarks that have been made by Nigel Don, clearly it's in this com uh, committee's remit to suggest in future work programmes that we look at how this has worked. And indeed, after this Parliament in the legacy paper, if the members are agreed, it's something which we can flag up for future committees to look at. And in those, uh, you know, in that light, uh, I see uh, that uh, we should come to a vote now, and uh, we. Therefore, invite the cabinet, sorry, to cabinet secretary to wind up if he feels he needs to before we come to that vote. Only to agree with Alec Ferguson. I also hope he is wrong, <laughs> <laughs> and it's certainly not for the first time. And that. <laughs> <laughs> Could I just clarify <laughs> that that won't be the first time you you, you think I might have been wrong? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I accept the clarification. Uh, and of course to say that I very much welcome the committee's constructive approach this morning and the purpose of the committee system in Parliament of course is to return to those issues and scrutinise uh, legislation after it's been uh, enacted to see if it's working appropriately and likewise I'm sure the government would want to do that as well and will do that uh, but any advice that you can bring forward in future years I'm sure will be welcomed by, by the, the government of the, of the day. Thank you. Um, therefore we put the question on the motion that is... The question is that the motion S4M10052 in the name of Richard Lockhead be approved. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. Um, therefore, we will call the vote. Uh, those who are in favour of uh, the motion, please raise your hands. 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Put your hands down. Those who are opposed, one. Those who abstain, none. Uh, so the record shows that the vote was a total of eight in favour and one against. Therefore, uh, it suggests that the committee is in favour of uh, the motion and that, that therefore we will recommend uh, to Parliament that it should accept this uh, motion just now. So thank you all for your involvement. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. Well, a short break till we... Uh, move on to the next item. Agenda item four, uh, the Scottish Government's Wild Fisheries Review. And this agenda item is for members to take evidence from Andrew Thin, the Chair, and Jane Hope, the panel member uh, of the Wild Fisheries Review. I welcome Andrew and Jane uh, to the meeting, and I invite Andrew to make any opening statement he feels he should just now. Um, thank you very much indeed. I have a very brief op opening statement. We're here to respond to your questions and we're still in the early stages of the review. Um, Jane Hope's with me, as you've indicated. The other member of the panel, just so you're aware, is Michelle Francis. She's not here. Um, the review, uh, the terms of reference are in your information papers. I think you're aware of that. Essentially, the review is about modernizing the structures and the systems whereby we manage wild fisheries uh, in Scotland. Um, ever since the 1960s, actually, 
various reviews have suggested that we need to modernize these structures. We've never quite got round to it fully. Um, we've been asked to produce recommendations that will fully uh, modernize those structures, and that's what we're doing. Um, we're doing it through a very open, a very collaborative process. We've already held 29 meetings at the last count. <laughs> I was in the air last night. Uh, 29 meetings with stakeholders, um, and there are a great many more still to happen. And I do think that's terribly important because of the nature of this sector. It's, there's an awful lot of people involved in it, a lot of strong feelings, a lot of uh, different issues. Um, we, we've uh, so far managed to uh, get from Dumfries to Orkney, Stornoway and Montrose, so we're covering the country. Um, there is also a web, a web page, website, um, and importantly, we're issuing monthly progress bulletins through that website, but also anyone can get onto an email mailing list. So everybody knows the way in which the thinking of the group is, is, is developing, and I, I do think that's hugely important, because people therefore feel part of it, they feel able to contribute through, through these meetings, through the website, and so on. Um, and as, as far as one can make a review like this collaborative, I think we're doing so. Um, I don't want to go take you through the terms of reference. Uh, that, that would be somewhat boring, but there are and just a, I, th I think there are probably five themes in there, and it's worth just summarising. The, the, the first is the whole issue of, a, of accountability. Uh, wild fish are, um, insofar as they're anybody's property, they're public property, uh, and the, the whole business of accountability for the way in which they are managed, both nationally and locally. Uh, is a central theme of this review, in particular so that democratically elected structures can lead and direct in a strategic manner the management of those fisheries. The second uh, theme is that of transparency. I think we're very clear that the people of Scotland need to be able to see how and why things are being done to manage their fisheries and what the outcome of those, uh, the performance, if you like, of those actions is transparency highly important. The third theme is that of local empowerment. This is, this is an, uh, a sector that um, the vast majority of which, uh, 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 the management of which needs to be done at a local level. There's a colossal uh, voluntary resource, uh, uh, voluntary enthusiasm already involved in this sector. We need to harness that, we need to really use it. It would be completely daft, I think to centralise and turn this into some sort of centralised bureaucracy. Um, the fourth theme uh, is that of uh, doing things in an evidence-based manner. Everybody and his dog appears to have a view about how best to manage fish. Um, we are clear that, um, I'm not gonna, I don't think, uh, you know, at the end of the day, this is about democratically accountability, but on the basis of good, robust science, scientific advice. Um, and lastly, a theme that gets forgotten, I think, by those who are already involved in this sector. This, this should be about increased participation and increased public value. The people of Scotland should, as a result of our recommendations, get greater public value from their wild fish and their wild fisheries. That's absolutely fundamental to this. Um, it's fairly early days in the review. We've been going um, since uh, March, but we have We've got a reasonably clear sort of beginnings. I just want to finish by making a few points. Um, I think we're fairly clear that there needs to be some sort of national leadership in this system. There, there really isn't at the moment. It's driven locally. And, and while I emphasize the importance of local commitment and enthusiasm and um, so on, the elected government of the day needs to be able to ensure that it can fulfill the national policy priorities and the elected government of the day needs to be able to ensure that it can fulfill international obligations and international uh, uh, agreements. So we're clear that there needs to be some small, I emphasize, small national strategic function to direct uh, national, to ensure that there are national priorities delivered through this system, to ensure that there is a consistent quality of delivery across the country, to ensure that science and research and data collection are consistent across the country. But that doesn't mean to say it has to be done by a central function. It simply needs to be led by a central function, and I emphasize that. 
So the second thing we're very clear about is that we will need to recommend a really effective network of local fisheries management organisations. Now we have a system of some 60 or 70 local organisations already. Um, so we're not starting from scratch. But the challenge is to how do you make that fit for purpose in a modern uh, world in a way that is inclusive, but a way that is also accountable and transparent. Um, and we've got a lot more thinking to do on that. We've got some ideas. The third thing I want to emphasize is the importance of finance. Um, I think we're clear that at the moment the system is financed by a number of different means, many of which are derived locally, many of which are not entirely transparent. Insofar as the, uh, the system needs to deliver national um, policy priorities, we think it needs to be funded through a system whereby there is a degree of national control over that funding because that ensures that national priorities are then delivered. But that doesn't mean that all funding should be national uh, at all. Uh, on the contrary, we need to pull off the trick of a, a central system with modest finance uh, raised through some appropriate manner that can deliver national priorities, then greatly enhanced by local delivery bodies that can raise local resource, financial volunteering and all sorts of other resource. Um, and that's a trick we're going to have to pull off. And lastly, um, some of the species of wild fish in Scotland are under threat. Um, and we need to make sure that the way in which they are harvested, if that's a fair word for recreational fishing, uh, and certainly including netting of some species, um, is sustainable. So we're doing some serious thinking about the possibility of legislative change, including the use of quotas, including the use of licensing, uh, in order to ensure that fishing is sustainable while at the same time delivering greater public benefit. So that's where we've got to. Very quick gallop, but I wanted just to set the scene. Over to you. That's very helpful indeed. Um, I've got two questions already uh, lined up. Graham. Uh, Day followed by Alec Ferguson. Uh, thank you, Kabir. Good morning. Uh, I guess my question, I hope, will also help set the scene. Um, this is referred to as a wild fisheries review. Yet, in terms of the remit, we're told the review will look forward, not back. It will not reassess how well the current system operates or how it might be amended. Now, it strikes me that, at least in terminology terms, there's a contradiction there. I, I wonder how you can look to improve things if you don't consider where we are now or best practice examples in Scotland. It may be that you're doing that and this is just a terminology issue. Because presumably, if nothing else, as you go around the country, and I'm thinking perhaps particularly of Montrose, you'll be hearing about live current issues and how people think they might be dealt with. So I just wonder if you can give us a bit of clarity on the approach that's being taken here. Um. Well, absolutely, that's common sense, and I, saw, I couldn't disagree with anything you've said. Um, and I think it is a matter of terminology uh, rather than anything else. Clearly, we have to understand very, very well how things are operating, what the current challenges are, what the current strengths are. And we've, we, I think we've, we've actually um, got a pretty good grasp of that from the 20 or 30 odd meetings we've held already. Um, and certainly issues like netting in Montrose. It's a highly politically very visible issue. Um, so <laughs> we've been to Montrose. You wouldn't be surprised. Um, so, so yes, but I think the point being made is an important one too, that I don't think the review should simply th look at this in terms of how could we meddle with the current system to make it better. I think it's right. Um, and in fact, there's been calls for this since the Hunter Report in the 1960s to replace the current system with something that is more fit for purpose. But that doesn't mean uh, on the basis of completely failing to understand where we are now. But that, that's reassuring because I mean, this committee visited, for example, the River Dee. It made a trip there and we saw a lot of good things happening there. And I'd like to be assured, I think, Amber, what you've said, that these good best practice examples are being taken account of and the work you'll be doing. So thank you for that. Alec Ferguson. Um, thank you, convener, and, and good morning. And can I just start off by very much welcoming your recognition of, of the importance of local level management, because I, I'm, I'm sure you would agree that 
there is a good argument to say that every single river, river catchment is an individual and, and has differences. Um, you can't just generalise about how to manage a river catchment, and I, I, I just very much welcome that approach. Um, can I just tie down one aspect of the remit, which I, I'm not just certain about, because in the paper we have the first bullet point under remit says that you are to consider from first principles the challenges and opportunities facing Scotland's wild fisheries. Now, I am aware from no lesser uh, uh, a journal than um, Fly Tying and Fly Fishing magazine, um, specifically May's edition, that you have been sent a letter from uh, Dr Richard Shelton, the former Government Freshwater Fisheries Laboratory at Pitt Lockery, head, head of the laboratory at Pitt Lockery, in which he states, my colleagues and I at the Freshwater Laboratory and our opposite numbers in the Irish Republic have known since 1989 that the collapse of sea trout populations in West Highland, Scotland, was being driven by the large number of sea lice associated with the cage rearing of salmon. It is a problem that continues to get worse and greatly depletes salmon populations in fjordic systems. Now, you were talking about the sustainability of some species and the importance of looking at that. So, to cut to the chase, will you be looking at the impact of aquaculture on wild uh, fish stocks? Can I make two or three points? First of all, um, the review is very much about systems and structures that will enable us to manage uh, all these different challenges. There's a lot of different challenges, aquaculture, climate change, and a whole heap of them. Um, so I think, and I think it's important that we focus on getting the system right. Um, I think the second point to make is that no two, no two scientists ever seem to agree, in my experience, on anything. And um, I seem to get conflicting advice on this issue just as much as many others. Um, what I, so, so what I am clear about is that the outcome of this review will be a system that can, can collect, collate and analyse data and evidence in order to, for us to be absolutely certain that we understand what's happening in relation to sea lice impacts on these populations and we can deal with it. So that, that you would consider that one of the, 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 the challenges that the but wild fisheries yes, faces? Yes, what, what, what we're not going, going to do, and we're not being asked to do, is to review the science. We're, set, we're, oh, no, we're, we're reviewing syst systems. But, but the, system will be, will, the system will not, in my judgment, be fit for purposes if it's not then able to address all these major challenges. That was very useful. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, convener, and, and good morning to you both. Could, could I ask you about the development of skills um, for the future, which within the scope of your, um, your remit is one of the issues that you've highlighted? And uh, um, we've, we did visit a number of places, including a hatchery in marine science um, in the north of Scotland as a committee. And I'm wondering the degree to which you will be able to focus on that. What will be a changing picture? Of, you've mentioned climate change already, uh, but a, a whole range of issues in terms of fish stocks and, uh, and how to take that forward. So I'd like to know how you're getting evidence about that, if I may. The, the, the evidence um, in relation to skill requirements has been collected uh, primarily through all these uh, meetings with fisheries boards and so on locally, much the same as you did, actually. Um, but we've probably got the time to do more of them. Um, so I'm, I'm satisfied we're getting good evidence. I think the, the key priority for the system is, I, I think, probably twofold. One is to make sure that the system delivers consistent competence right across Scotland. It's not reasonable that the people of one bit of Scotland should not have access to the same competence as people, uh, people whose fisheries are in another part. So consistency is a real issue because we're already very clear that the, the, the skill levels vary around the country. And that's partly because of, that's partly an issue of resourcing, of course. Um, the second issue, however, is that I don't think, um, I think it's increasingly clear to us that um, skill levels tend to be a bit static. There isn't a particularly good continuing professional development system in this uh, industry. Um, and I don't want to, I don't want people to go away and say, oh gosh, they're obviously not up to, up to the mark, because that would be wrong. Um, but I think we need to build into our recommendations clarity about uh, national consistency and uh, a, a national system of CPD 
that ensures that skills stay up to the mark and, st and, and adapt to changing circumstances. And a good example is aquaculture. Another example is climate change. Another example is invasive species, where we, we simply don't know what's going to happen over the next 20 or 30 years. So we need people's skills to adapt so that even if you are 55 or 60 and r managing a river, your skills are still competent. So I th I th I, you know, I'm quite comfortable that we'll get that right. But we're not there at the moment, I don't think. Thank you. Um, we'll have uh, Jim Hume next, please. Th th thanks, convener. Uh, um, and good morning to uh, Andrew and Jean. Uh, I'm obviously quite aware of some of the good works that, that's happening in, uh, in my own region. Of course, the Tweed Commission and the Tweed Foundation, some of the work they've done on the rivers, the, the increase in the, the fish numbers, as well as other invertebrate invertebrates and some of the... Uh, not just in the tweed, but uh, of course it's tributaries. Uh, uh, you talked a lot about national policies and how the, there should be a central system, albeit you did mention about uh, keeping localness there. I mean, I'm obviously concerned if we do see a, a centralising off uh, decision making regarding regarding uh, our wild fisheries or uh, our wild fish, because the Nith and the Solway and Galloway and, and the borders can be quite different to some of the concerns up in Montrose, for example, in the, in the River Dee. So, in, in your view, uh, what body had you thought, or maybe you hadn't thought, uh, sh should be looking after the sort of national policies centrally, and how can you foresee the changes that we don't throw the baby out with the batter, uh, bath water and ensure that there is local decision-making, which will, of course, in my view, help people to adapt, as you talk about, and give speedy, um, more speedy um, answers to problems in different parts of Scotland. Can I, can I draw a very clear distinction between central strategic leadership and, and centralisation? I think it's a really important distinction here. Um, I think it's right that the elected government of the day has the ability to provide central leadership to this system in the public interest uh, in relation to what are legitimate national priorities, which may be about international agreements or they may be about national policy priorities. That seems, that seems reasonable, but that's about leadership. That's not about centralization. Um, so I draw that very clear distinction and I think I will continue to emphasize, particularly given experience south of the border, I will continue to emphasize the importance of local delivery and central leadership. Those, that, that makes that point. Um, the question of how we might do it, yes, there are some thoughts, and I'll maybe let Jane sketch those out a wee bit around some sort of central thing, but I, I, I don't want people to go away and say, oh, they've decided that, because we, we genuinely have not at the moment. Here's some ideas. Jane will sketch them out. I was actually just going to, before we get to the ideas, as Andrew says, uh, it's early days, so I'm a bit nervous about um, saying too much too soon, but... I was struck, or I've been struck, by how many of the questions keep coming back to this central question of how do you get the balance between local ownership and all that good input you can get locally, but needing uh, the national oversight on some functions. And I was just um, put in mind of, of a little bit of work uh, that somebody did uh, for the panel about experience elsewhere. And... Um, I should add, I'm no great expert on fisheries. I come to this um, with a completely open mind, which has its uses. Um, but interestingly, in Ireland, uh, they completely reorganised their uh, wild fisheries and they reduced the network to seven regional fishery boards coordinated by a central fishery board. And I, I get the impression that everything was fine for a while and this system gave a regional focus and retained, retained stakeholder involvement. Um, but it started to go wrong, I gather, uh, when the Central Fishery Board started to expand its role rather than providing the support to the regions. Um, and that, it seems to me, is absolutely typical of what we have to make sure we avoid. There is a place for the local and there's a place uh, for the national, but we must make sure that those two roles are well understood so that in creating um, a more centralised, very small structure, it doesn't over time start to grow and, and expand its powers. So that's, that's a lesson from Ireland. And I'm also struck by uh, what was said at one of the open meetings I went to in respect of 
particularly in respect of sea lice, there's a very good example of how uh, the critical mass of expertise at a local level just isn't enough to deal with the really big challenges. So again, uh, while management is best delivered locally, we still, I think, have to provide for some access to central expertise uh, on the really important issues, and sea lice may be one of them. So all the time, uh, we're going to have to get that balance right. And um, I think I'd rather let Andrew talk in terms of what you think those models might be. Let me just sketch this very briefly. Um, I think it's... Um, so central leadership, that, it seems to me that that could be achieved by probably a single, a single commissioner. I'm just using the word loosely. Uh, commissioner or, or, or whatever. You could come up with any old title, frankly. But a, a single person appointed through open competition by, the, by, men, by Scottish ministers to give you that democratic accountability and with a very small secretariat. But drawing on existing... Uh, people and resources and expertise in marine Scotland, Scottish natural heritage, Scottish environmental protection data. So not adding costs, but simply drawing on what's all that already there. And I think you could deliver that function with something as small as that, really, really very small, very tight. Um, and that would still give you that national accountability, which is really important. That uh, commissioner would then uh, agree with local delivery bodies um, annual fisheries management plans, or perhaps five, annual, f five yearly fisheries management plans, which, wh whereby they set out how they intend to deliver uh, a range of national and local priorities that they consider uh, that they wish to pursue. There needs to be some sort of mechanism whereby the commissioner then can core fund some of that and the rest of the funding and resource. And I, I emphasize this is not just about money. A lot of this is about volunteering resource. Uh, can, can be raised locally as it is at the moment. Um, and those, those local bodies, you know, I, I don't know at the moment exactly how many, but probably quite a few of them to get localism really working, probably having charitable status because that's hugely helpful in, in all sorts of ways for, 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 for raising resource. And, and probably adhering either directly to a model constitution or at least having a constitution which has been agreed with the commissioner so that it, to ensure inclusivity. I think inclusivity at a local level is important. Um, I, I'm not persuaded at the moment that you need a fully democratic structure at a local level if you've got a constitution that ensures inclusivity. Thanks, that's useful. Dave Thompson. Yeah, thank you, convener. Uh, good morning to, to Jane and, and Andrew. Um, it's really to follow on from, from that same issue. Um, <clears throat> I, mean, I, like, I like the idea, the, the principle of being led nationally. You know, you lead nationally, but you do the thing on the ground locally. I mean, I think that is the right way to go. But again, just getting to how do you ensure that the, the commissioner has enough power to do what he or she needs to do without, and at the same time prevent them from expanding that power and being overbearing because that would be the danger and the tendency, I think, of any sort of central body that over time they might see they want to expand. But, and okay, I know I'm, we're getting into detail here and you, you won't have you know, thought through all of this but I, I do believe we, there needs to be someone that has the, the central power and authority to lead and direct, especially on issues like the sea lice issue and the standoff, if you like, between aquaculture and angling. We need to try and get a resolution to that. It's been rumbling on for far too long. So you do need someone that can, you know, get a grip of the issue and... Uh, make sure it's dealt with. Uh, for instance, would you be thinking that the commissioner, um, to use that phrase, uh, the, the powers that the commission might have uh, would include the, the power to um, compel regulators to report to the commissioner and so on, so that it wasn't, I don't think it would work probably if it was purely voluntary, because if the commissioner is going to be really effective, he or she would need power to say to the enforcement bodies and the other bodies that are involved, 
I require you to report to me on what you are doing about such and such, and so on. So you, you would need to draw up a pretty clear list of powers and responsibilities. So there's really the two things there, you know, and, and how do you make sure it, it, it doesn't then try to expand? Because I, I really like the model that you're outlining here, and uh, I could see it being effective in a whole lot of other areas of, of work as well, where you have the lead from government, which gives you your broad standards, but you actually do things on the ground and there's a lot of delegated authority on the ground. Um, again, I'm sketching out preliminary thinking, uh, just to emphasize that. Um, I think the office of the commissioner will need to be established by statute, uh, with clear statutory power and statutory duties, um, and possibly a degree, um, something in there that, 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 deline that, de that delineates and therefore limits as well. And I think that can be done through statute. Don't have the detail yet, we've got to work on that. But I think that can be done. Um, I think uh, if the commissioner has the, the power to raise some money and then provide core, some core funding to the delivery bodies, that, that enables the commissioner to ensure, because he controls the money to some extent, that national priorities are delivered by the local bodies. The local bodies, however, must be free, I think, to pursue local priorities as well, for which they can raise local money, and we need to work out a system for doing that. Um, so the fact that the, the Commissioner is able to core fund the delivery of national priorities creates that control mechanism down. And I need to think through the detail, but that's, that seems to work. The one thing that remains then is, what, what happens if a local body fails, just, just as useless? Can happen. Um, I think we'll need to build into this some reserve powers, uh, reserved back to the Commissioner. I don't at the moment have a clear view about how to do that, but the sorts of things that we're thinking about is the reserve power to invite an adjacent local body to deliver national functions in an area, that type of reserve power if necessary. Um, and it could be, you know, the statute could, could include significant provision whereby the Commissioner can do, so, do certain things on the authority of Scottish Ministers, which keeps Scottish Ministers in, in control. So, so, sorry that's not in, uh, very detailed. J Jane has got a few things that she can add. <laughs> no, I'm just going to add one further thought to that. Um, funding is a big driver, as Andrew's indicated. The other big driver, which keeps coming through to me in all of this, is um, data information. And it, it seems that the amount of good information about stocks of fish is remarkably poor. And one thing um, this proposed commissioner, it seems to me, must have is the power to require um, information about stocks. At the moment, district salmon fishery boards may collect information, they may do it in different ways, but they don't have to share it with anybody. So our knowledge of stocks is, is really pretty poor. So it seems to me that whole thing about uh, commissioning the information and then collating it and making it publicly available is crucial in all of this. And on that, a lot of the decisions linked to the national strategy must hang. But at the moment, we don't seem to have uh, that basic information. Can I just come so back quickly? Several people, people, yes. Yeah, yeah. Dave Thompson, um, several people. Just a suggestion. Um, a model you might want to look at, it wouldn't fit perfectly in relation to this, is how the Office of Fair Trading, before it was done away with recently, operated UK-wide. But the enforcement of um, trading standards legislation was done by local authorities. And there were clear demarcation lines between the two. It might be something that would give you a start. It wouldn't be the solution, but that kind of model might be worth just having a wee look at. Dave, uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, Graham, Dave. Uh, uh, thank you, Convener. Um, perhaps you've kind of half provided the answer on what you just said there about the coation of data and the difficulty of actually finding out what's happening out there. But looking at sustainable management and conservation of stocks, you'll be well aware that uh, in an ongoing context, there's a considerable variation in catch and release practices on, on rivers right across Scotland. 
Um, and I'm wondering if, as yet, you've come to a view on whether we would need perhaps a more consistent approach to catch and release across the country if, we, if we're to get where we need to be. Well, every river is different, so, and, and, and I think it's important, uh, this is partly why localism is so important in this equation, every river is, is, is different. Um, I, I think it's unlikely that, so in the sense of, of, of having a standard catch and release policy for Scotland, I think that's unlikely to be necessary or, 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 uh, at any rate. Um, however, I think we are clear that, that more generally we are going to have to come up, if, we're talking, if we just focus specifically on salmon for a moment, we are going to have to come up with a system that enables right across Scotland the control of how many salmon are killed in any given system, and in particular, the control of how many salmon are killed in the first six months of the year. Because the spring salmon, are there are not so many of them come back. They, the, they have a very high value to local economies, to hotels and so on, because people come and fish for them in a, in a period of the year when there's not much else doing in terms of business. Uh, so they're economically and socially very important to Scotland. So in particular for that first six months period, I think we will come up with a, a system, a quota system or, or something. I'm not quite certain. We might, I mean, one example would be, we might, we might propose that it's illegal to kill a salmon in the first six months of the years unless you have a licence to do so. And then licences could be issued to netting stations if the scientists think that's safe. But I, 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 I do want to do a lot more detailed work on that. I'm going to ask a couple of questions myself and then Nigel, Don and Claudia to follow on. Um, back in 2005, uh, the Scottish Executive proposed in a document uh, that led eventually to the Aquaculture and Fisheries Bill um, and, and so on that um, they favoured a unitary authority model for salmon, trout and coarse fish. Um, and indeed, we have this situation where there's district salmon fishery boards and there are foundations or trusts. What's your take on uh, the way forward with regard to those two separate entities? I think we're very clear already on that, that, that the local, whatever they're called, let's call them local fisheries management organisations, they will be all fisheries management organisations. We're very clear about that. And the reason I say that is because on our visit to the D, um, the D Trust was able to access considerable sums from the SRDP for uh, matters such as uh, planting trees to create dappled shade to encourage salmon to spawn in the river uh, far up uh, as we all visited. And um, you talked about um, there being central funds and funds that are able to be raised locally. How does the uh, likes of the SRDP match up with those two concepts? I would, I would anticipate that uh, in some ways, as happens now, a local fisheries management organisation would wish to apply to the SRDP for habitat uh, management uh, measures of, uh, of an, and, and, and that's already happening. So I don't think we would be proposing any change there, actually. That's happening and, and, and many of these trusts are doing really first class you, know, you go down to the Tweed and you see some really excellent work being done down there, for example. Have you any calculations about how much SRDP money has been accessed by trusts and can you do so? Uh, we, 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 we could do that, but um, given that we're trying to look forward here and given that the SRDP is changing, it's going to be difficult to, to relate that. I think the important thing is that we set up a structure that can access SRDP in whatever form it takes. And it's, and it's important that what, what we recommend is a structure that's going to be fit for purpose for, for, for some decades. Um, and therefore, you know, part, of, part of what's driving our thinking is how do we design a system that is sufficiently flexible to cope with change. There may not be an SRDP in 10 years' time, there may be something else. And we need a system that's, that's sufficiently flexible to deal with that kind of um, opportunity. <laughs> Interesting. Um, just to, as a final point at the moment, um, it comes to my attention as I ha have various uh, salmon fishery boards in my constituency, inevitably, that there is a kind of uh, view on the one hand of the riparian owners and the view of angling clubs, which perhaps are seeking more access to rivers. 
Um, and uh, clearly, the issues about the economic value for the local authority for the local area um, are perhaps tied up with uh, the ability to have more access for more popular fishing. Have you um, encountered that so far in your uh, evidence taking? There, there, there clearly are um, significant access issues uh, in some parts of the country, um, but I, I, I wouldn't want members to go away with the impression that that's universal. Uh, it's not. There are some very good examples around the country where access is available to anybody at very low cost, uh, including access for salmon fishing, I, I should say. However, there are, significant, there are significant issues to be addressed by the review. If we are serious about increasing participation in Scotland, if we're serious about, in particular, bringing more young people into this sport, um, we need to uh, address access issues, which are not just about geography, they're also about particular days of the week as well. Um, so that's very much in our sights. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to give you answers at the moment because I don't have them. There are, there are, we're, we're picking up a lot of really good suggestions, some of which are really quite radical, um, and we need to f work through the unforeseen consequences before we come to recommendations. <laughs> Uh, Nigel Don, followed by uh, Claudia Bibish. Thank, thank you very much, convener, and, and good morning, uh, colleagues. Uh, as the MSP, who actually represents the aforementioned Montrose, I have uh, some knowledge of the difficulties there. But I'd like to come back to the structural issues, because clearly one of the issues about netting anywhere is that the fish which are caught are not just going up the river, which happens to be nearest, but actually the whole coast for what might be a considerable period. And much of that is actually my constituency, but that's not really the point. In structural terms, I suspect that gives, I suggest that gives you a problem because it just doesn't follow that any netting operation anywhere in, around our coast is automatically particularly relevant to the very local fisheries board. And I'm wondering whether you've given any thought as to how you structurally you might deal with those two perhaps orthogonal uh, issues. Um, yes, uh, th that's absolutely correct. Um, the mixed stock fisheries are a particular challenge and we don't have enough science at the moment to really manage them well. Um, th that said, uh, Marine Scotland at a national level is already doing some very good science on mixed stock genetic sampling to try and understand what's happening. Um, I don't think the structural issue conflicts with that. Um, government at a national level already undertakes research into aspects of salmon, particularly offshore, um, and local mechanisms already undertake research and data collection at a local level. That already works. Um, I don't think that needs to change particularly. The challenge will come when, um, as I think we probably will need to, we, we, we will want to set quotas on licence uh, for these sorts of fisheries. Um, if you don't know exactly where the fish are going or where they're from, how do you know what quota to set? And, and so clearly... Um, a new commissioner's office, one of the strategic priorities for, the, for ministers, I would suggest, would be to get that science done so that we can deliver that. And I think, I think that's already happening. I think ministers already made it clear to Marine Scotland that that's a priority. But, but as the science gets better, we will be able to get better at setting quotas for these, these things. And I, I don't think... Scientists tend to... There's always a tendency among scientists to say, you can't do it until it's perfect. I'm not sure that I'm persuaded of that argument. I think we can do something which isn't perfect, but is better than where we are. And I think our recommendations will be couched in those terms. So here's what you could do for the next five years. Here's what you could do over the next two decades. Can, can I agree with your view of science as a science scientist who became an engineer? I mean, tolerances are absolutely what you have to work with. and. and, and Often your data isn't very accurate and you just have to live with that unless you can improve it. Uh, but I'm still interested, I guess, in the structural issue of how you manage operations which, if you like, if, if I can do it diagrammatically, nets in, the, the fish that are being netted anywhere are going up the coast, whereas the fish that are being angled are going 
up a river. Um, and, and because those are, are different operations and they're different stocks, which is right to say are mixed, how do you, how do you manage that? I, 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 I don't think there's a big structural challenge in there in that I, I think you have to set any kind of quota setting. If we're, if we're going to go down a road of controlling culls and then issuing licenses or quotas to cull fish, salmon or any other kind of fish, um, it is almost certain that those quotas or those licenses will have to be issued uh, nationally. I think it's very hard to see how one could issue... Um, you'd get into all sorts of conflict of interest issues, uh, quite apart from anything else. Um, and as you rightly say, you've got you know, fish that, uh, that are not of one. So I think, I think the issuing of quotas, if, if we go down that road, would have to be done as part of the national structure. And that's doable. We already have within Scottish Natural Heritage and within Marine, Marine Scotland and within SEPA licensing functions for all sorts of other licensing issues. So the marginal cost of adding one, if you've got the science, is not that great. Here be Mish. Thank you, convener. I, I'd like to identify myself with the remarks of our convener in relation to participation in fisheries, which was going to be a question, but I'm pleased that the convener raised that. Um, I wonder in that relation um, what opportunities you have had or will be able to make to connect with local communities beyond the fisheries boards to, to find out what the interest is, taking your point that there is good practice as well as some exclusive practice. Um, so, so that was my first question. I suppose the other is about um, inclusion of fish. We, we were, I, I was a bit embarrassed as, as one of the committee when we were looking at the aquaculture bill to find that uh, I hadn't really thought very much about um, the coarse fishing and, and that aspect of it. And, and that's from the people point of view, but also the protection of fish beyond, um, beyond the... Um, the salmon and the sea trout, for which I am actually a species champion, but um, and, and I'm worried about it as well. But but really, just wondering about that broader issue. Um, we, we are we are heavily involved in consulting with the uh, assorted industry, but there are lots of different bodies in this sport. So there's there's coarse, there's coarse fish bodies, there's bodies devoted to pike, there's bodies devoted to grayling, um, and and I've. I've found them very effective, actually, at articulating different local interests in different parts of the country. So that's worked fairly well. We have not yet engaged that well, I think, with local authorities, uh, community councils even. Insofar as we have time, we will try and do that as well. But I, I, my impression is that the, the, these lead bodies do a pretty good job. Um, th there isn't any question in my mind that a, a big part of the increased participation will originate in places like, you know, Scottish Canals, of which I happen to be chairman, so I'll just declare that, but, but Scottish Canals has just launched a new programme with the, the course angling body um, to promote ki getting kids out on the canals uh, fishing for coarse fish, and that is leading to troubles because th there are parts of our community that like to eat carp and things like that, and so they go out on the canal with nets, which are actually illegal. So they're, they're, they come... That you then get into issues about pol policing, not, I don't mean police in the sense of police Scotland, but, but uh, how do you deal with that? So one of the work streams that we are pursuing at the moment is the whole business of, well, how do, I, how do you actually ensure adherence to wild fisheries legislation with, with very modest resource, there's bailiffing things and so on. But there are, I was in air last night and I was in Strathclyde the night before, fantastic, um, uh, examples there of voluntary bailiffing going on. Now, if we can get that better coordinated with proper national licensing, uh, national training, we, we can feed into other agendas there, employability and things as, as well. So there's, 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 this can potentially take us into a lot of really interesting areas. Convener, if I may just briefly, um, uh, in, in relation to any concerns about... Uh, conflict between different groups such such as um, netsmen and, and anglers or, or any other um, issues of conflict. Um, there, there have been quite um, interesting models put forward in relation to agriculture in terms of mediation and I'm wondering if in terms of your national structures and leadership whether you're considering anything um, in terms of um, opportunities for, for mediation resolution in a positive way. Not yet. Uh I'm not at the moment persuaded it's going to be needed, but 
Um, fingers crossed. <laughs> I'm also involved. Well, I, I, I mean, I'm also involved in the tenant farming review, so I'm very aware of that and um, very aware of what the opportunities could be. Um, also, very aware of the potential cost. Okay, Alec Ferguson. Um, thank you, Kevin. If I can make two brief points and then put one question, um, if I may. Um, I think it was Jane Hope mentioned the, 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 the need to, to gather better data and information in some regards. I, I would just point out, and I, I think in particular relevance to, to the sea lice issue that I raised earlier. Um, Access to that data is extremely important as well, I think, and a lot of the work we did on this committee previously would suggest that access to the, the existing data that does exist, very detailed uh, data on sea lice in particular populations, uh, is not that easily accessible by some of the bodies that I think would benefit hugely from having access to it. So I would just make that point. Um, I, I, I would also hope... Um, I think, Andrew Thin, in, in your opening statement, you mentioned alien invasive species. Um, and certainly, I'm coming to this rather parochial point, but in, in Loch Ken, in my area, um, where there was a very, very strong, thriving um, uh, coarse fishery, which was of very great importance to the local economy, um, it has been virtually wiped out by, uh, as I can see you nodding, so you'll be well aware of the American signal crayfish issue, for which the best advice available from SNH, frankly, seems to be um, that they are handing out pamphlets advising coarse fishermen to make sure they wash their gear thoroughly before they go home, while these animals spread up to two miles every night. Um, and so I, I hope you will be able to give that some considerable thought, the impact of alien species on, on our coarse fisheries in particular. Um, the question I wanted to put to you um, is, is quite simply this. How do you envisage guaranteeing the independence of a single commissioner appointed and answerable to Scottish ministers? Independence would be quite important. Um, well, I... We have a work stream to try and define more clearly the legal status and duties and powers and so on of that commissioner. Um, the extent to which that commissioner needs to be fully independent of the government of the day, I think, is, 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 is one that needs quite a lot of thought. This is about elect, democratically elected governments being able, having the tools to ensure that their priorities, whether that's about international agreements or policy priorities, are, can be delivered. So in that sense, the fact, you know, just as, well, for example, I was chairman of Scottish Natural Heritage for many years. It is an arm's length body. It gives good, robust, independent advice. People don't always like it, but we do. Um, I was, however, appointed by Scottish ministers, uh, reported to Scottish ministers, and could be dis dismissed by Scottish ministers at the drop of a hat. And that seemed to me an entirely reasonable position because I wasn't elected. They were. Um, I would anticipate that it would be something fairly similar. Um, arm's length, yes, but, but not in the independent in the sense that the commissioner could go and do something that, that, that a democratically elected government felt was not a priority. Could I just follow that up with one, yes. one thought, um, which is that might it not be... Well, would it be worth considering a model whereby the commissioner is actually, you mentioned being democratically elected, is democratically elected by the boards, uh, by the local boards over which he or she would have authority to deliver the national priorities. And I don't argue with the need for some organisation to be able to deliver national priorities and indeed international commitments. Um, I, I can absolutely understand where that's coming from. But I wonder if that's not a model that might uh, be worth considering. I certainly consider it. Um, it's a very interesting idea. It hadn't occurred to me. Um, I heard it here first. <laughs> I will certainly consider it. Um, I can just hear voices saying, that's not democratic. What about all the people who are not involved in these local boards? But, but, but yes, let's think about that. I'll leave it with you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, in that case, I've got another question at the moment. Um, we've uh, experienced, of course, rivers which uh, do restocking and other rivers which do not. And uh, this is in terms of salmon, of course, and it's quite important to see the variables that there are in terms of uh, the impacts on these geographically and so on. Um, how much have you taken that into account when you're thinking about uh, the way in which uh, the, these rivers should be managed, given that 
science would suggest that these things are possible. Um, that science suggests also that uh, they've been successful in some places. And do you see a place for your recommendations to include uh, remarks about restocking or not? No, I, I, I don't think it, it would be wise for the review to go into the detail of how to, to manage fisheries at a local level. Um, I think we need to set up structures uh, which are capable of deriving good, robust science and then making evidence-based decisions. That's very important. And that, on that particular issue, you get conflicting advice, as you will be well aware, um, from, 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 from scientists. The important thing, I think, is that local delivery bodies are free to set their priorities um, and raise money and get on and do things on the basis of decent advice. And if they choose to stock, they should be free to stock, subject to you know, car licenses and all the rest of it. Um, and if they choose not to stock, they should be free not to stock. I don't think that's something that one should be dictating. Jane Hope explained a little about some international uh, comparators of management. Um, do you have any international comparators on stocking or not? I'm afraid I don't. I don't have enough knowledge myself. Um, but we did um, ask some of the advisors to the panel to just have a look at experience elsewhere. We were particularly interested in um, structures and funding. So I'm afraid on, on the details of how things were managed, uh, no. But, but the arguments are much the same in Ireland, New Zealand, Canada. It's all about how do you get that local versus national balance, what's the role of government, uh, and how do you raise the funds? I mean, that seems to be what it boils down to, and I'm assuming you don't want to get into that now, but those are the sorts of issues that we've been looking at. Okay. Are there any further questions at the moment? Yes, Alec. I just wanted to expand a little on the, the restocking issue that you raised, um, convener, and again, I'm going to be rather parochial in the example I'm going to use, because I have a, uh, a situation in the constituency, I think it is beginning to calm down, but where the local fisheries trust um, and the, uh, a particular angling association on the, the River Cree, um, open warfare might be going a little bit too far, but the, there was considerable disagreement about the restocking policy being carried out by the Angling Association um, a, a, and real bad feeling between two organisations that should have been working to the same end and, and, and we'd all be a lot better off if, if they were. And I just wonder whether, in a, I, I, can, I think it is right that there should not be a sort of national, you will stop that river. Um, I think that should be the sort of local decision that, that is made locally. Um, but I wonder whether you would envisage a sort of role of arbitration sort of thing for a commissioner in a circumstance like that. Um, I, I, and this takes us back to the media point, mediation point as well. Um, I do hope that if we can come up with a structure of local delivery organisations that are constituted in a properly inclusive manner, the level of disagreement will tend to die down because people will have confidence that they've got a voice in those bodies and those bodies are, if not fully democratic, at least are inclusive in the way they're, they're led. So you won't have a situation where you've got a fisheries board and a trust trying to do the same thing in the same piece of water. You know, one delivery body with a board that, by and large, people are confident is inclusive and representative. And that's the challenge for us, is to make that happen. Um, I will think about the question of whether the Commission needs powers to mediate or, 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 or whatever. It's a, useful, it, it, it's a useful point, although one can easily envisage a situation arising where squabbles would then become easier in a way, because you would say, well, we'll have a squabble about that and then we'll just hand it to him. <laughs> it's sometimes quite good if people have to sort their own problems out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll be an interesting measure of your success if the situation on the Cree in five years' time is looked upon as part of history. Okay. Put that one down as a marker. Thank you. Um, I have a, perhaps a final question. I'm hopeful, but uh, you never know. There may be other people who have his memory's been jogged. Uh, Graham Day. So I don't know the other question, it's an observation uh, following up uh, Alec uh, Ferguson's previous suggestion about the uh, Commissioner being elected uh, by the, 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 the organ local organisations. There would, of course, I suggest, be the risk of considerable uh, turnover in Commissioners, if that were the case. So you, you might wish to consider that. Uh, I will. I, it's, it's an interesting suggestion. I haven't thought about it. I will certainly think about it. My, my instinct has been from day one 
to, to look at a model where democratically elected governments have a mechanism. And that's your democratic channel. Thank you. Okay, um, that's a good introduction to the subject. Very, I'd like to thank uh, Andrew and Jane for their uh, uh, thoughts at the moment, uh, developing issues there. And uh, with that, I'm going to formally close the meeting. Uh, at this point and next week on the 28th of May the committee will take evidence from the Land Reform Review Group on its final report and consider the committee's annual report. <laughs>